So thanks to the worship team. It's actually a good thing I'm not a musician, because I would definitely up the average age of the worship team. So I'm three-fifths of a century, or currently 60 years old, or 60 minus Epsilon. Epsilon's a small positive number, so I would definitely up the average age of the worship team. Now, in Scripture, there's many different names for God. And the promise of the Lord in Isaiah 52 verse 6 is that my people will know my name. You know, because when you know God's name, you know him. And Psalm 9 verse 10 says, those who know your name can trust in you. Because God's name represents his attributes, his character, his nature. So let me ask you a question this morning. How many names of God are listed in the Bible? Any ideas? Sorry, Pam, what is that? 967. Very impressive. (laughs) We actually thought at Life Group on Tuesday, imagine if we started a series on the names of God. One name per week. We'd be finished in 18 years and seven months. By the end of May 2041, the series would be over. But let's put aside the calculators. Let me ask you another question. Of all the names of God in the Bible, what is your favorite name? Now, if I asked that worship team, they would probably recall to me the lyrics of the Hill Songs. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is. What a wonderful name. What a powerful name, the name of Jesus Christ, my Lord. Perhaps one of your favorite names of God in the Bible is one of the following I'm going to list. Jehovah Elohim, which means God in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It means the creator, the one who spoke the universe into being. Universe means one sentence. He spoke the universe into being. Or perhaps... One of your favorite names of God is Jehovah El Shaddai. That's the almighty, the omnipotent God, all-powerful, all-knowing, the one who's sovereign over the earth, sovereign over the nations, sovereign over all things, and yet intensely personal in our lives. One of my favorite names is Jehovah Nissi. Jehovah Nissi means the Lord is my banner, my covering, the one who gives me victory the one who encamps about me and surrounds me with his unfailing love. It's a picture of running that victory lap around the stadium. You've got Olympic gold, you're running that with the flag of the country around you. That's exactly the meaning of this name. Maybe your favorite name of God is Jehovah Rahi, my shepherd, all my days, all my life. Jehovah Hane Amen. My faithful God who keeps his promises. The one who's firm and unshakable, steadfast, the one in whom I can put my trust. Or how about Jehovah El Roy, the God who sees me. And there's many others, and all of them have context in Scripture. But let's flip to the New New Testament. Do you know that in the book of Revelation, there are 72 names of God? And maybe some of those names are your favorite bright morning star, the word of God, the lamb, the alpha and the omega, the first and the last, the self-existent one who has no beginning or end. Who likes tattoos here? Anyone like tattoos? Maybe your favorite name is Revelation 19 verse 16, where it says, on his thigh, Jesus has written, King, capital K of kings, little k, And Lord, capital L, of Lords, little L. Now, all these names of God are worthy of our praise. And all of them just reveal something to us about the attributes, the character, and the nature of the God. But let me ask you this question this morning. Among all God's names in the Bible, what is his favorite name? Any ideas? What is God's favorite name? Father, 
How do we know that? How do we know that's his favorite name? Well, we know that because Jesus uses the name Father when on every occasion that he spoke to God and about God. In fact, in the Gospel of John, over 156 times, Jesus uses the name Father for God. So let me give you a quote from from Rory Dyer. So let me see if I can get this. How does this come to life? Is it on there? Okay, perfect. So Rory Dyer, he's he's impacted this local church, and, and he gave... He told us this. He said, all of Scripture can be summarized in one word, Father. So like the disciples, we say, show us the Father, and that'll be enough for us. And through every moment and all of our ministries, we pursue the Father heart of God for ourselves and for those we do life with. So this morning, I'm going to talk to us about the Father heart of God. So let's pretend that you're all guests, that the last two months you have no idea what we did at Lighthouse. Let's just look afresh at the Father heart of God. You know, God loves us so much that he wants to adopt us into his family. And beyond that, he wants us to call him Father. See, Jesus taught us the most powerful words known to man. My Father, who is in heaven. And this name, Abba Father, is one of the most significant names to help us understand the Father heart of God and how he relates to us. Now, the word Abba was an Aramaic word, which means Father. And the Jewish scholar, Jehokas Jeremiah, said this. He said that, Abba was an everyday word. It was a homely family word. And no Jew would have dared to address God in this manner. Yet Jesus did it always in all of his prayers that are handed down to us. Except with one single exception. There's only one time in the Bible that Jesus did not call God Father. What is that? It's on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And the reason for that brief moment was that so that we could have God as our Father. You see, a quote from Max Licardo says this, what is God's mission? Is your adoption. That is God's mission. You see, when you come to Christ, the moment you come to Christ, in Romans 10, 9, you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, from that moment you're saved, your sins are forgiven, but something more happens. From that moment, he adopts you as his child. And you go from condemned orphans with no hope to children that are adopted with a loving heavenly father. So Romans puts it this way. It says, you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. And now we call him Abba Father. And the spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. So this leads me to the next question. Why does God adopt us? What does he hope to gain from it? Well, the answer is given to us in Ephesians. Ephesians tells us that his unchanging plan has always been before the creation of the world to adopt us into his family by sending Jesus Christ to die for us. Why did he do it? He did this for two reasons. He did it because, number one, he wanted to, and number two, It gave him great pleasure. That is why God adopts us. Is it because you're very beautiful or very handsome or, you know, you're a brilliant sportsman, outstanding businessman? No, that's not the reason God adopts you. He adopts you because 
He wants to, and it gives him great pleasure. You see, now your heart belongs to your heavenly Father, and he loves you because you belong to him. You are his. And he's a perfect father, faithful in all he does. He's committed to you. Zephaniah 3.17 is a wonderful verse about the father heart of God. Now, this has done something strange here. Um, let me see if I can get this back up again. So Zephaniah 3.17, as it come up there, this is a very interesting passage about the Father heart of God. It says that the Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves. He takes great delight in you. He quietens you with his love, and he rejoices over you with singing. Now the Hebrew meaning of that frame, that phrase rejoices over you. You know what that means, literally. It means dances, skips, leaps, and spins around all the time singing over you. That's what it means. Your heavenly Father loves you so intensely that he dances over you with singing. He cannot contain himself at the thought of you. That's what the Zephaniah means. And with the greatest of joy, he takes your arms in his arms and he spins you around and around all the time singing over you. That is exactly what Zephaniah 3, 6, 17 means. And the more you say, Father God, let's just tone it down a bit, but embarrassing, someone's going to hear you, the louder he sings for all of heaven to hear because of you. That is what Zephaniah three seventeen means. You see, your heavenly Father sees you always through the eyes of the cross. And he sees your heart surrendered to Jesus and it brings him such joy that he just spins you around like a child and he sings and he dances over you. That is the heart of your Father God. He cannot contain himself because of you. That is the literal meaning of Zephaniah. Let me ask you another question. How does he adopt you? What is his method of adoption? How does he adopt you? Well, this we know from Galatians. It tells us that God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law. Now, the word redeem means what? It means to regain possession of something by making a payment. In this case, Jesus. So that he could adopt you as his very own children. And because we are his children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts so that we can rightly speak of God as our dear Father, calling out Abba Father. Sorry, I didn't put it all up there. So that is, so his purpose was to redeem us because of Jesus, to make us his children. We receive adoption. We don't earn it. We don't buy it. The Father simply invites us to take a place at his table. It's an act of grace, an act of mercy, to be part of his family. And he takes you as you are, and he loves you because you're his, you belong to him. He's your father, your ever father, and you're his child. He wants to adopt you, and it gives him great pleasure. You're a seal upon his heart, the apple of his eye. So this morning, I want us to pursue the Father heart of God. And I'm going to do it by looking at two parables Jesus gave in Luke 15. Maybe three, but we probably won't have time for that. So the first parable we're going to look at is the parable of the lost sheep. So Jesus gave him this illustration. There was once a shepherd with a hundred sheep. But one of the sheep wandered away and was lost. So the shepherd left the 99 sheep in the open field. And he searched in the wilderness for that one lost sheep. He didn't stop until he finally found it. With exuberant joy, he lifted it up, placed it on his shoulders, and carried it back home with cheerful delight. Now the sheep wandered away. 
the shepherd found it and brought it home. The sheep did not intentionally defy the shepherd. A sheep that wanders off is often a sign of sickness. And a single sheep that wanders off is vulnerable. And according to the shepherd, the sheep is lost and alone. Based on the shepherd's opinion, the sheep doesn't even know it's lost. People don't intentionally get lost. They become lost. But this parable is not about the sheep. This parable is about the shepherd who leaves the 99 sheep for the one that is lost. So the shepherd looks at the flock and he starts counting. Let's count with me. One, two, three, eight billion, sixty-seven million, four hundred and twenty-two thousand six hundred and eighty-five. That's the world population today, minus one. Minus one. There's one missing. The shepherd counts again. Eight billion, sixty-seven million. 422,685, one is missing. When he showed one is missing, he calls the lost sheep by name. John 10 verse 3, the shepherd calls his sheep by name. No response. The shepherd does not sleep. He does not slumber. He goes in search of the lost sheep. He leaves the 8.1 billion sheep. And when he finds the lost sheep, what does he do? He bends down, picks it up, full of mud, dirt, smeddy, places it on his shoulders, and joyfully carries it home. Let me ask you a question. How much work does the lost sheep do to get home? Nothing. Not much at all. The shepherd does all the work in carrying the lost sheep home. It's a scandal of heaven. So the first point of this parable is that the Father heart of God is a heart that bends down, picks us up, places on his shoulder, and carries us. And the picture we get is of the great shepherd, Jesus carrying the cross, filled with its shame, bearing on his shoulders what we rightly deserved, so that those who are lost can be found and be brought home to the Father's house. The shepherd left the 99 sheep to search for the lost sheep. Jesus left all of heaven to search for you and me. That is the heart of Abba Father. You know, this parable of the lost sheep and the love of a father was played out in the 92 Olympics in Barcelona. Remember, we hadn't competed for 32 years. This is the first Olympics we were part of. And I remember being riveted to it. Watch Lana May do a 31, 16, 31, 11, sorry, 10,000 meters. But I remember watching a 400 meter race. And in this race, Great Britain's Derek Redman, he won his first two heats. And when the gun went off for the 400 meter semi final, he knew that his lifelong dream of winning an Olympic gold medal was in view. But as he entered the backstretch, backstretch, it's about 200 meters to go, he tore his hamstring. And he struggled to his feet and in cruciating pain, he tried to hobble to the finish line. You may have watched that. But suddenly what happened is that Derek's father, Jim, bounded out of this grandstand, past the security guards. And he came alongside his son, put his arms around him. And he said, son, let's finish this together. And in front of 67,000 spectators in that stadium, the father accompanied his wounded son to finish the race together. 
So I'm going to play you that, just that two-minute clip of it. You're probably familiar with it. Let's just watch it. It off again. I don't know what's come on. Eh? How do I stop it? Don't do it? Oh, okay. So, there's a verse in Matthew 7, verse 11. Let me see if I can find it. Oh, sorry, Amy. Matthew 7, verse 11. if I can get the slides up here. And it says this, it says that if you imperfect as you know, are, know how to lovingly take care of your children and give them what's best, how much more already is your heavenly Father? How much more already is your heavenly Father to give wonderful gifts to those who ask Him? How much more? You see, how much more does your heavenly Father care for you and love you? And it's only by God's grace that we run the race that he set for us. And sometimes in the race of life, we tear our hamstring. I've torn a hand. I was a marathon, marathon runner. I remember running the Marathon. marathon. I was at the halfway mark. I was with the top three leading group guys. Winning between 116. Tore my hamstring. It happens in, in life. I mean, just in normal life. And sometimes a curved ball is thrown at us. And just when we think the race is over, your heavenly Father bounds out of the stands and he comes alongside you and he puts his arms around you and he whispers to you, my son, my daughter, let's finish this together. You see, the Father heart of God is a heart that will carry to completion the good work he has started in you. The young folk in the music team, 14 years old, God will carry to completion the good work he has started in you. You know, when my younger brother was two years old, he used to wake up every hour of the night crying. And my dad soon learned that whenever he gave him some water, it would settle him. And it turned out that my younger brother had what's called insipidus diabetes, which means that if you go without water for two hours, day or night, you will go into a coma. And as a result, for four years, my dad had never had more than one hour continuous sleep, always watching over his younger son. 
And my brother could wake up safely every morning because his dad was watching over him throughout the night. How much more? How much more? Your heavenly father. You see, the parable of the lost sheep is anchored in the father heart of God and it's a heart of affection for you. His son, his daughter, the shepherd is always watching over you. Psalm 121 explains it this way. It says, the one who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he never slumbers or sleeps. The Lord himself watches over you. The Lord stands beside you as your protective shade. The Lord watches over your life. The Lord keeps watch over you as you come and go, both now and forevermore. And the parable of the lost sheep reveals to us the heart of the Father. The Father heart of God is a heart that is always watching over you. Not just one hour continuous sleep a night, he's always watching over you. He's eternally awake and alert, unlimited in strength, your heavenly Father never slumbers nor sleeps. He's available every minute of every day for the entirety of your life and into all eternity. Your heavenly Father does not grow faint or weary or grow tired. You know, when I summarize the parable of the lost sheep, the most beautiful summary I could find is by a lady. I've never, never met her, not even a theologian. Her name is Mary Crowley. And this is what she said. She said, every evening, I turn my worries over to God. He's going to be up all night anyway. You see, it's a beautiful understanding of Psalm 121 that God watches over you. He's always watching over you. Now, the second parable we're going to look at is about the parable of the lost coin. Again, this is no fault of the coin that it got lost. But this is one of the most beautiful parables Jesus gives us about the Father heart of God. Let's read it. Luke 15. Jesus gave them another parable. There was once a woman who had ten valuable silver coins. When she lost one of them, she swept her entire house carefully and diligently searching every nook and cranny for that one lost coin. When she finally found it, she gathered all her friends and neighbors for celebration, telling them, come and celebrate with me. I lost my precious coin, but now it's found. Now, losing a coin is a loss, but it's different to losing a sheep. A sheep's got emotions, it's fluffy, makes a nice sound, bah. A coin has no emotions, no sound, no feelings. But this is the most beautiful parable Jesus gives us, and I'll explain to you why. You see, when you lose a coin, you lose the ability to use that coin. But... The coin's value isn't lost. It does not lose its value even when it's lost. If I had a hundred buck note and I want to buy a cappuccino and I lose my coin, my hundred buck note, and I find it again next week, what is the value of that hundred buck note? One cent, ten cents? It's a hundred bucks. It hasn't lost its value at all, you see. So even though it's lost, it's still valuable. The actual coin has inherent value. The coin may be lost, but its value is never lost. Where was the coin lost? It was lost in the house. And your Abba Father cares about things in your house that are lost, just things that affect you personally, such as lost dreams, lost hopes, lost expectation. Lost relationships, maybe loss of a parent, loss of a child, loss of a husband, loss of health, loss of memory. Even in your loss, no matter what you have gone through, 
your value has not been lost to your heavenly Father. God does not define you by the ways the world defines you. Your value is never lost from the first breath from when you pop out of the womb until your last breath when you get to spend eternity face to face with your heavenly Father. When the coin is lost, the woman never gives up ownership of the coin. You are valuable to your Father God because you are His and you belong to Him. He will never give up ownership of you. And in this parable, the heart of the Father never gives up searching for the coin. The woman lights a lamp. Now, in those days, they didn't have many windows in the houses. I don't know why. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And when the light of Jesus enters our heart, our house, he points us to the heart of the Father. And the dust and dirt that has covered your value and worth, anything that the enemy has done to pull value from, the li- from your life, that dust, the Father carefully and meticulously clears away. Anything that clouds your vision of your value to Him, the Father sweeps it away. And He brings restoration. You see, the coin may be lost, but its value is never lost. And this is beautifully illustrated in Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5, Jesus has an encounter with a woman with the issue of blood. Disguised, she presses in through the crowd. She slips in from behind and she touches Jesus. And Jesus stops and said, who touched me? Now, she should have known better. She did know better. For 12 years, she had chronic menstrual hemorrhage. And Mosaic law defined her as unclean, according to Leviticus 15. According to Leviticus 15, excessive blood flow made that woman unclean. Mark 5, verse 26, tells us that she suffered a great deal those past 12 years. And the Greek word they use for suffering here is pasco, which describes mental and emotional suffering, not just physical suffering. For 12 years, she had forbidden, she'd been forbidden to attend church. When she came to the door, the welcome team would take out a broom and sweep her away, just sweep the dust and dirt on her and chase her away. You see, as an unclean person, she had to stay away from church, from family, from people. She was very alone. No one wanted to be around her. No one dared be around her because they would become unclean. If she touched furniture and you touched it, you were unclean, according to Mosaic law. She couldn't go out in public. Couldn't be hugged by her family. 12 years quarantine from people. 12 years COVID lockdown. No contact with people. Hadn't touched somebody for 12 years. She was tired, worn out, and intensely lonely. If she, an unclean person, touched a priest, if she touched Frank, what would happen? The Mosaic law demanded she be stoned to death. Leviticus 15. She now touches Jesus, the high priest, the Messiah, God with us. She should have known better. She did know better. Jesus said, who touched me? And the woman realized that she couldn't stay hidden. She began to tremble and fell to her knees in front of him confessing that it was her, an unclean person, who touched him. The account in Luke is even worse. Luke adds this dreadful sentence, the whole crowd heard her explaining to Jesus why she touched him. The whole crowd. 
a crowd that could turn on her. No escape with so many witnesses. The angry eyes of the crowd, stones in hand, were just fixed on Jesus, waiting for the command just to stone her. Jesus' eyes were fixed on the unclean woman who dared touch him. What was the first word Jesus said to her? First word Jesus said to her. What was the first word Jesus said to her? Daughter. First word he said to her. Let me just play you the clip of this. This is the end of... um, Let's just watch the last few seconds of this. Let me see if it can... My daughter. I'm no one's daughter anymore. Look up. Yes, you are. Daughter. You see, Jesus looks in her in her eye and tells her that she's beautiful, she's loved, she's valuable because she's a daughter of a heavenly father. The coin may be lost, but its value is never lost. She may have lost her health, lost her family, lost friends, lost her church, but her value was never lost to a heavenly father. The disciples said to Jesus, show us the Father. That'll be enough for us. And Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Daughter. The first word Jesus said over her. The Father heart of God. Daughter. What is the name of that woman with the issue of blood? Does anyone know? Anyone know her name? I wanted to know her name. It's not recorded in Scripture, so we've got to dig a little deeper. All the original biblical manuscripts have a name. The biblical scholars, the historians, all record her name. Her name is Veronica. So I looked up, what does Veronica mean? And you know what it means? It's Latin for vera icon, which means true image. Her true image was daughter of your heavenly father. The first word Jesus said to her daughter, he speaks a name declaring, this is your name. Your true image is that you are first and foremost a daughter of your heavenly father. You see, a coin in those days had the image of a Roman authority on it. You have been stamped with the image of God. Even when we are lost, even when our health is lost, whatever you've lost, that image is still present. The coin may be lost, but its value is never lost. And whatever had devalued her, her father restores her identity. He says to her, I love you, I always will, because you're mine, you belong to me. You are my precious son, my precious daughter. That is your true image. That's what her name meant. My son, my daughter. So do you understand this parable that Jesus gives us of the father heart of God? He says, whatever you've gone through, could have lost a husband, a wife. Whatever you've lost through, you lost your health. Whatever you've lost... You have not lost one iota of your value to your heavenly Father. Isn't that a beautiful parable that Jesus gives us? Let me close with the words of Max Lucada. Every heart needs a Father. And our heavenly Father is the perfect 
Father. Let's just pray. Father, I just thank you for your word. Thank you, Jesus, for giving us those parables that you're always watching over us, that you pick us up, put us on your shoulder, and you carry us home to our Father. You're always watching over us. You never slumber. You never sleep. You will carry to completion the good work you've done in our lives. And Lord, we just thank you for that beautiful parable of the lost coin, that whatever's lost at no point from our first breath to our last breath will it affect our value. Yes, you are my daughter. Yes, you are my son. That is your true image. Holy Spirit, won't you seal the truth? Whatever anyone's lost yet today, whatever they've lost, won't you, Holy Spirit, just sweep that dirt and the dust that clouds their vision of their value in your eyes? Holy Spirit, just wrap the arms of Jesus around them. Let them see the heart of their Heavenly Father. That they are loved because we belong to you, we are yours. Just seal that truth on people's hearts. Father God, we, we don't know how we managed to exist without the knowledge of your parenthood and your loving care. But now we're your son, your daughter. We're adopted in your family. We can never be alone because, Father God, you're there beside me. And we will sing your praises for all eternity, Lord. We love you, Father. We acknowledge we need you. Our eyes are often just fixed on you. We love you, Father God. Thank you for the truth of your word. Let us be anchored in you, Lord. Thank you, Father God.